Uh, would you open them to Hebrews chapter 11? We are continuing our series in the Hall of Faith. So those great Old Testament heroes. And this has been one of my favorite uh, series. I've only done two of these so far, but I've preached many times before. But uh, Hebrews 11 has become one of my favorite uh, series to do. Okay, we're going to read verse 17 through 19 together. So let's read this together. One, two, three. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. This is the word of the Lord. Very good. Um, at the school I'm teaching at, I teach at TCIS, if I haven't reminded you enough. Uh, it's finals week. So in Korean, uh, keep my uncles out, right? Um, our students are busy studying. That's probably why you don't see any of them here. Like, oh, I don't see any TCIS here today. They're probably studying for their finals. Um, but us adults, think back. When was the last time you had to study for an exam? You guys remember? Anybody? Has it been a long time? Recently, sir? Well, the, the, the Soji question. Oh, <laughs> okay. Let's not get into that here. Soji is uh, sexual orientation, gender identity. That is something that we're studying here at TCS, and I won't unpack that here because that is a whole other conversation. We can be here a whole week. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> I totally forgot about that. There were a lot of questions. Yes. Did you pass the test? I did. You did? Okay, good. Good. So, how many of you actually like taking tests? Nobody, right? I do, I do, I love taking No, 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 no. You'd be like some weirdo. Um, but tests are stressful. Tests assess what we've learned over the course of a semester or year. And the result of a test has lasting implications. Tests impact your grade, your GPA, what colleges you get into, what grad schools you get into. And so we dread tests. But tests also serve an important purpose. They prove whether we've truly mastered the material. A test doesn't just measure knowledge. Tests reveal the depth of our learning, the depth of our understanding. And the higher the standards of the test, the more it separates those who have excelled from those who haven't fully grasped the concepts. And in a similar way, the Bible describes that God gives tests to his believers. Today we'll look at the story of how God tested Abraham's faith by commanding him to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. This was an extremely difficult test, but it demonstrated the incredible depth of faith uh, that Abraham had in God. Today, instead of my typical sermon points, I usually like, if you're new here, I like doing sermon points like three-point sermon. They all start with the same letter, like promise, purpose, practical, uh, practice. I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to go over five questions, kind of like a test, right? So the first most obvious question is, oh, I need to turn this on. It's on here. There we go. Yeah. So the first obvious question that we need to look at, and it's the one that you're probably thinking of as you enter the story, is why does God ask for a child sacrifice? Right? Before I get into all the other things, why did Abraham sacrifice Isaac? This is just a difficult passage. God tells Abraham to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. You have to put yourself in Abraham's shoes. He lived in Mesopotamia in 1600 BC. We know at that time period that child sacrifice was normal. And wasn't happening every day, but it was something that was typical of Canaanite culture. And it was a way of showing one's devotion to whatever the local god was. And the Bible speaks about Abraham's Canaanite neighbors sacrificing to the god Molech, M-O-L-E-C-H. So when God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, it was something that would have been socially acceptable to the culture. This would not have been bizarre or unheard of. If he heard God say, I want you to sacrifice a child, he would have heard, oh, 
yeah, Molech tells their, their uh, followers to sacrifice to him. However, we also know from other passages that God absolutely condemns these evil practices of child sacrifice. In books like Leviticus and Deuteronomy, God explicitly instructs the Israelites not to make the children pass through the fire to Molech. Basically, do not commit child sacrifices to Molech. So, at first glance, there seems to be a contradiction. God is commanding Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, which goes against God's clear prohibitions against child sacrifice elsewhere in Scripture. And so it's really puzzling. However, the passage in Genesis 22, and we'll be jumping around quite a bit from Hebrews 11 to Genesis 22, so if you want to have your uh, fingers, I guess, or if you have two bookmarks, you can have it placed there. But if you look at Genesis 22 and see how it starts, it says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. While the details will be explored more fully, we can see that from the outset, this is an unusual circumstance. Right? This is not God actually endorsing child sacrifice. Instead, it was a unique way of seeing what Abraham was capable of doing. So I know that doesn't completely answer the question. I will get to the answer later, but just to let you off at the outset, let you know at the outset, this is an unusual circumstance. So, the second question is, why does God test? Why does God test? Verse 17, by faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. First of all, let me define what a test is. A test is simply a way of measuring the quality of something before using it. Right? If you're an ancient metalsmith, you would test the purity and quality of metals like gold or silver by putting the metal through the fire. You want to see how pure this metal is. In today's context, you'd want scientists testing vaccines, right? You would want them to test a Pfizer vaccine or AstraZeneca vaccine before they distribute it to the public. Why does God test his people? When God chooses people as leaders, uh, he singles them out. And a test shows whether these leaders will truly trust and follow God's direct instructions, even when it's difficult. According to Jewish tradition, uh, God tested Abraham's faith ten different times. Last week, we learned about Abraham's first test when God told him to leave his home country and journey to an unknown land. Remember that? Go. Leave your country. Where am I going? I'm not going to tell you. Okay. And he followed. Abraham passed that initial test with obedience. Passed it with, we say, flying colors. However, before the binding of Isaac, which we'll look at today, Abraham faced eight other major tests from God. You know, the command to sacrifice Isaac was the final test. It was his final exam. It wasn't the first. And Abraham didn't pass every single test perfectly. There were times when Abraham failed miserably. He got S at the time. Right? Two occasions when he lied. Uh, let me see. Yeah, these two. Sarah abducted by Philistines and Sarah abducted by Egyptians. He lied to these two kings. Right? He told Pharaoh and he told Abimelech that his wife, Sarah, was actually his sister. You guys know that story? And Abraham stumbled in those moments, and he uh, failed. He got an F for those. But there are other times when God passed, I'm sorry, Abraham passed the test. When God instructed Abraham to send away his son Ishmael and Hagar, he passed that test. Why? How was that a test? Right? He showed that he fully trusted that God's promises would come through his son Isaac alone. He didn't treat Ishmael as a backup heir, like a substitute plan, right? Oh, if I, this thing with Isaac doesn't work out, oh, I'll have a lot of children through uh, Ishmael's line. He didn't do that. He sent Ishmael away. So by the time that uh, Abraham experienced this test from the Lord, he was a seasoned veteran. He was a graduate student. This test was his doctoral dissertation of faith. So this was at the end of his life, not at the beginning. 
And so God had been shaping and molding Abraham's faith through all of these tests all along. And so uh, the answer to that question, the question was, uh, why does God test? God tests not for his own knowledge, but to strengthen his followers' faith. God wants to see and prove the quality of our faith through tests. And if God tests you, you should consider it a compliment. Psalm 11.5 says, God tests the faithful, but ignores the evil ones. Right? He doesn't care about evil people. He's just letting them run their lives. If you're being tested, that means God likes you. And he wants to grow things in you. And when you pass the test, it's a way of building spiritual muscles. Right? Obedience and faith becomes easier. When you work out physically, think about those who like weight training. Your muscles grow stronger by encountering resistance and being pushed. Similarly, our faith grows by facing tests and trials. Right? Tests are spiritual exercises that push against and strengthen our faith. Without any difficulties or struggles to push against, our faith muscles would remain weak and underdeveloped. So think of God as your personal faith trainer, and he gives us tests so that you would become spiritually stronger. So push through these tests, and you'll, in, you'll gain endurance. You'll gain perseverance. Another thing that tests do, they reveal our weaknesses. They show areas that need improvement. For example, a test might show that you're lacking mercy, or tests might show that you're lacking patience. Another thing, tests also refine and mold us into better versions of ourselves in line with God's vision. Through these challenges, God is building spiritual resilience and perseverance in you. So when you face a trial, you should be excited. How many of you get excited when you see a test in front of you? How many of you get excited when there's a trial? Not many of us, right? But the Bible tells us in James that you should rejoice, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face a test. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, right? The Bible tells us that God tests those he loves. So God is a good teacher. There are some teachers who make tests really hard. Um, uh, for those of you who work at TCS, Mrs. Smith talks about like teachers making things like, oh yeah, you'll never get a seven in my class. You'll never get an A in my class. There are some teachers who want kids to fail. God is not like that. God allows challenges in our lives and he you put these tests in our lives to shape us into the people he wants us to be. My wife and I recently experienced a huge test uh, last from April to November. She was diagnosed with thyroid cancer uh, last April and it was a shock to our family. And our family had to experience many tests each day. And my wife had to literally take tests, uh, you know, once a week. You know, we would shoot up, travel up to Seoul for a test and she would have to wait several weeks on the result, not knowing how serious the cancer was. There was another test when we had to decide whether she should remove one thyroid gland or two thyroid glands. And the actual surgery was a huge test for us when my wife was in so much pain for several hours. And all we could do in this test was to trust our Heavenly Father and sing hymns to Him. And it was a difficult experience but our faith grew stronger through this test. We came out of it able to trust and persevere a bit more than we could before. That test strengthened our spiritual muscle, muscles. So my brothers and sisters, I know that many of you are going through difficult tests right now. Just in my mind, I can think of three or four really serious tests. Do not lose heart. View this challenge as a chance to strengthen your faith and depend more on God. This trial, see this trial as an opportunity for spiritual growth. Look to God during the season for his help and guidance. So do not be discouraged if you're being tested, but see the potential for your faith to grow through persevering obedience to God. The third question, why does Abraham have to sacrifice Isaac? Right? God could have asked Abraham to sacrifice something else. Abraham, by this point, was very wealthy. He had flocks, he had goats, he had rams, he had bulls. Why not just sacrifice one of those things? Or as an alternative, why didn't God say, sacrifice your material riches? I want you to test your faith by 
choosing to be poor. Another possibility could have been Abraham to sacrifice himself. Right? He could have said, I want you. Why Isaac? It had to be Isaac because Isaac was the son of the promise. Isaac was the one that he, Abraham, and Sarah had been waiting for for 100 years. Right? They had been waiting for this miracle baby, and now this miracle baby is here. And this is the one baby through whom all peoples on earth would be blessed. This is the vehicle for all of these other blessings. You know, I will bless you with a great land. I will bless you with many uh, descendants, as, far, as many as the seashore. I will bless you to be a blessing to the rest of the world. Isaac's the one, right? And here's Isaac. He's around 25 years old. He's unmarried. Isaac was supposed to be the heir through whom these world-changing blessings were foretold to come. Isaac had no grandchildren, didn't produce any grandchildren. And yet, for three agonizing days, it appeared all of God's promises would be broken. Because if Isaac were to die, there would be no promises at all. Right? So using Isaac in this ultimate test maximized the strain on Abraham's faith. It was like Abraham maxing out, if you're familiar with working out. Because God alone gets the glory, glory and the credit. There's no room for doubt about God's sovereignty over any circumstance. Question number four. How was Abraham able to obey? Let me read today's passage, Hebrews 11, 17, B through 18. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead and so, in a manner of speaking, reason that God could raise, I'm sorry, manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. So Hebrews 11, 9 is telling us that Abraham reasoned. He used logic. That's the Greek word logizomai. He reasoned by faith. Right? Genesis 22, 5 is fascinating because Abraham reasoned by faith in Genesis also. If you see, if you read Genesis 22, 5, he says to the servants that were with them, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. If Abraham didn't have faith, he would have said, we will worship and I'll come back to you alone. Because Isaac's dead, unfortunately. Isaac won't come back with me because he's dead. No. Abraham says, we, me and Isaac, will come back to you. How was he able to say that? He had faith that God would resurrect Isaac to fulfill his covenant promises. Abraham believed in God's ability to raise people from the dead. He was the first person to believe in the resurrection. The resurrection was never mentioned in Genesis up to that point. Okay? That word resurrection doesn't appear I can't even think of who's the first person. Maybe David, who explicitly mentions resurrection. Uh, but Abraham, here's an early believer, believes in the doctrine of resolution, resurrection. How was he able to do that? He and Sarah couldn't have kids. And yet God brought him a miracle baby. If God could do that, he certainly could raise the dead to life. And so he learned from all these other tests that some he failed, and a lot he passed, but he knew that God could do anything. The only thing God can't do is break his promises. Right? So Abraham embraced the promises of God. Hebrews 11, 18 says it right there. It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. That's God talking to him, promising him, this is the one. All of these things are going to happen to him. Right? So when God commanded Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, his only son... Abraham reasoned through how this would be possible. Right? He logizomai. He did deductive reasoning. What would that look like? Here's premise one. I wish I had written this down. But premise one, or fact number one. God promised me innumerable descendants and blessings through my offspring. Fact or premise number two. God said that this promise would come specifically through Isaac, not Ishmael. 
Conclusion, God would have to raise Isaac from the dead. So it's amazing how much faith and reason go together. We accept revealed facts, and then we reason from them. He reasons, and so he obeys. And we know how the story goes. God didn't stop the test until Abraham took up the knife. That's also interesting. right? This was a three-day journey. He was going from Beersheba to Jerusalem, about 500 miles journey. He could have said, oh, Abraham, after day one, I see that you got on your horse and you're willing to do it. You got all the preparation. Oh, that's good enough. I'll stop you right there. Or, yeah, he said, or by the time they got to the mountain, oh, I see you're ready to do it. Ah, uh, you can stop. I trust that you'll do it. Right? God didn't stop the test until Abraham took up the knife to kill his son. Why? Because it wasn't until that moment that the test truly took place. That decision had to be made, and the change in Abraham would only occur had he made that final choice to bring down his hand to kill his only son. And the moment that he made the decision to go through with it, that's when God stopped him. And Abraham was now a different man. And so God goes the whole way with Abraham, but only until the last possible moment he stops him. Some of these trials are going to go on a lot longer than you'll want them to go. Right? God is going to be testing you, testing your patience and faith, and he wants to see if you'll remain obedient and faithful, no matter how difficult or how long the test is going to last. So be prepared for God to truly test your faith to the utmost before providing relief or resolution. And we know that Abraham really sacrificed his son, apart from actually killing him because God stopped him. And so the text says that Abraham received Isaac back from the dead. And I can't imagine what that would have been like, uh, what kind of hugging and trembling would have taken place after he realized he didn't have to follow through with the test. He got Isaac back from death. Why is this story significant? This story of Abraham being tested to sacrifice Isaac is significant because it foreshadows and parallels the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in many amazing ways. I have a list here, and you can just take a look at it. I'm not going to go through every single one. But both Isaac and Jesus were miracle babies, born to parents who were un originally, originally unable to have children. Um, just like Abraham, Jesus was given many tests and passed them all perfectly. Uh, we see, I don't think I have that specific one. They're both figuratively dead for three days. Uh, Jesus specifically went through uh, tests in the wilderness, and uh, then the ultimate test came in the crucifixion, where he allowed himself to be sacrificed as a final offering. So in both the binding of Isaac and the crucifixion of Christ, Abraham, we see God testing his son to the absolute limit of sacrificing him. Right? Yet at the last possible moment, Abraham... I'm sorry, God provides a substitute for Isaac. Well, in the Jesus story, he allows Jesus to go through with the sacrifice to save humanity. And uh, also, I, I, I should have just left it here. Uh, there are other things that I want to mention. The location of Mount Moriah is mentioned in both stories. Mount Moriah is in Jerusalem and Golgotha, the same hill we're talking about, right? And after the sacrifice of Isaac was stopped, he was brought back alive. Just as God provided the ram caught in the thicket as a substitute sacrifice for Isaac, he has provided his own son, Jesus, as the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. God is going to test your faith. And so will you be ready? Instead of studying for this test by memorizing facts, what will truly help you through these tests is by embracing God's promises, just as Abraham did. We can remember this story God came through Abraham, that can inspire us. And when you read through the Bible, one of the things to ask is, is there a promise that I can claim? Is there a promise that I can claim? Here's one for you. In Hebrews, in Hebrews 13, 5, Jesus gives you this promise, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So when your faith is tested, you can remember that. And God, uh, you can remember that and know that God, Jesus, will... Uh, Never forsake you. 
Just as Abraham didn't receive an explanation when God told him to sacrifice Isaac, he simply obeyed because he was living by promises to him. He didn't need to have everything explained. One of my favorite pastors, Warren Wearsby, says we live by promises, not by explanation. Here's another promise. This is one of my favorite promises that I live by. Isaiah 40, 31. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. That is God's promise to me, and I hope it could be God's promise to you, that he will give you strength for any tests, and you can make that, your prom uh, that promise your own. As we reflect on how God tests Abraham's faith, it can make us very uncomfortable. Right? The thought of being asked to do something so difficult with one of our own children. God forbid anything happens to Jizang or Jin or any of your other children. And we might find ourselves asking, what would we do if we were faced with such a trial? The idea is too much to bear. God may not test us with something so extreme, right? Abraham was a unique case. He was a father of the Jewish people and the Christian faith. So he may not test, we don't have that kind of responsibility with us. And yet we know that God is always at work for our ultimate good, forming us and shaping us through various means, including through tests. And so our prayer is that we may become more and pe more the people that God intends us to be through these processes, letting the tests work in us what, they, what God wills. So we can take immense comfort in knowing that we don't have to fear God's tests because he's already provided the perfect sacrifice for us through his son, Jesus Christ. We don't have to earn our salvation by passing tests because Christ has done that for us through his grace. And we can be thankful for the tests that God brings us into our lives because we know that he is using tests to make us into the people he wants us to be. So let's put our faith not in our ability to be obedient, but in the finished work of Christ on the cross who was obedient in our place. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the example of Abraham's great faith. When you test our faith, give us the strength to endure and pass those trials. Help us to trust you completely, even when your ways don't make sense to us. Increase our faith so that we may obey you no matter what we may face. Give us confidence that you are in control and will provide for us. And we may and we hold tightly to your promises found in the Bible. We ask all these things in Jesus' faithful name. Amen. Let's all rise and close by singing.